Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Certified, Certiport's Educator Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Propo. Join us as we dive into the world of education, certification, and technology. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of Certified, Certiport's Educator Podcast. This is one of my absolute favorite episodes to record every single year with our wonderful educator of the year. And this year we have with us Karen Columbi, our wonderful 2023 certified educator of the year. Karen, thank you so much for being here with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to talk to you. So Karen, you have a very unique history with both your job and your experience in the classroom. So I wanted to start out with just a quick introduction into you and the work that you've been doing. So um, a little bit about how I started in certifying. Um, let's kind of back all the way up to my my first job. So when I went out, when I left high school, I did not go to college like most educators um, did. I didn't take that path. I went into the Air Force and I worked on avionics on F-16s and did a lot of traveling. Um, enjoyed that quite a bit, left and became a government contractor for a while in New Mexico, moved up to work in the Seattle area for Boeing. Um, During all of this time, I learned how to find jobs in a non-traditional role, as a non-traditional person. What I mean by that is, as a female avionics tech or female aircraft mechanic, it was um, a difficult time to find jobs like that. So I built up my my resume with things like licenses and certifications for my particular expertise and found that that opened doors for me, which was really useful. Um, After five years with Boeing and um, a lot of different hats that I wore for that company, I went ahead and went back to school. Leaving school, the day I graduated, they actually invited me to come back on Monday and teach. So I started teaching at a college. Um, Really enjoyed teaching at a college because I had kids then, and it was so much nicer to be able to be flexible with a nice part-time schedule that worked well for our family. After a few years of doing that, five years of doing that, a high school came over to recruit me, but it wasn't any high school. It was a technical high school, and the technical high school, they have two classes a day, and the classes are three hours long, so I was able to teach electronics and computer systems to kids for three hours a day. Again, trying to find value, I made sure that they could get certified and end up with um, licenses, certifications, and certificates in their area, um, which also led to a huge number of jobs for them. They all were, you know, many of them, I joke that anybody that wanted a job got a job or an internship um, because I had a lot of connections with business at that time. To, to help the kids on their path. Um, the program morphed into robotics. And what happened is every school picked up robotics, which made it difficult to fill that program. So I left the technical school uh, because recruiting became uh, too rigorous. And I went into a regular K-12 system where I taught computer applications. Um, I had never taught a one hour a day class. So that was going to be really interesting of how was I going to make this valuable? Uh, the program had a questionable past, um, very low enrollment, and um, many teachers had gone through that class. So I wanted to find a way to make it more valuable. I went to the community college and saw what they were teaching that was similar, and how could I make the program mimic the community college program more? Well, that started with certifications, with the Microsoft certification. And the Microsoft certifications validated all the skills. And that was the way to go. So uh, we started early, probably in uh, 2016, started certifying. And um, after that, it just built and the kids loved it. And I've been coaching them over that hill ever since. We've gone to nationals many years in a row. And a few times the students were able to make it to the world competition. So exciting. That's about it. And and I know that you're underplaying your involvement with all of that and we'll make sure to link the video about um you winning the award and interviewing the other um 
administrators at your school talking about your role in the program. So I know that you're a huge part of the success at Cavalero Mid High School. And it's been interesting to be able to learn more about your story and be able to kind of see firsthand what it's like to see you teaching in the classroom. But I wanted to hear your thoughts about this experience overall. What were your thoughts when you found out that you'd won this award? Well, first of all, the uh, camera crew, who was amazing, and the team that came from Certiport, they were so um, accommodating and kind and really trying to put things forth in the best light. They sort of told me they were recording for something else. So I was, uh, it was unexpected. It was very unexpected. Um, but it was humbling and then very gratifying to be acknowledged for, for my efforts. Um, after being happy and gratified, if you will, I really thought about it and thought, there's no way I could have done that without the support that I get from all the people that support me. Whether it's the people at my school, the people from Certiport, like they are on call. I literally have them on speed dial. They're amazing. Um, so without getting the kind of support that I get, and the opportunity that my kids get, thanks to our the way that our legislature um, values um, certifications, um, obviously, I don't think I would have even been considered for the award. So there's a lot of people that played into um, my success and my students' success. But it's not just my success, because when I thought about it, I thought there's probably hundreds of Karen Columbies out there working super hard that didn't get an award because they just didn't, because there we don't have. 200 awards to give out. So when I win this, it's kind of winning it for all of those in the trenches, teachers who are, you know, doing it every day. So kind of cool. I love that, that your recognition is also reflection of what everyone else is doing as well. We know there's a lot of people like you out there working super hard. And I know you talked about your experience was kind of a non-traditional path into education. So I wanted to back up a little bit and talk about what what drew you to education? What made you decide that you wanted to teach? Well, you could go back to my third grade teacher, Miss Rubick. I went to a Catholic Christian school, and she uh, she would always write on my uh, on all of my report cards, as most teachers get. Karen talks too much. Um, she she also wrote, "Karen wants to teach the class." So <laughs> I actually started this way back in the days. She would say that. I would not stop talking during the class. So a few times she would hand the chalk to me and say, you teach them. And I would just go teach them. And she had to shut me down. So I thought it was going to be after you went through a whole career in the Marines, everything else. No, no, it started all the way in third grade. (laughs) Exactly. I think it turns out that a lot of us are just like, hey, this is the way you should be showing this. This, They're not getting it because you should be doing it this way. And some people don't realize that that means you should probably be teaching somebody. (laughs) If you see a better way or an easier way to share things with somebody, that probably means you should be a teacher in some capacity. Um, Even when I was in the Air Force, there was a job that came up in the electronics school, which I really loved the electronics school. So I put in for that job. Um, I didn't get it. I wasn't the right rank, but it never stopped me from applying for jobs. Um, I always think of a job is having a wish list for what you should have to apply. And if I have half, I'll still apply. So um, the Air Force didn't buy what I was selling that time, their loss. But um, when I got a little bit older, I did, uh, I did really value helping people. When I was in college, um, my instructors saw that a lot, that I would try to break things down and make it easier for people. And that's why they offered me a job teaching. They said, wow, you have really broken everything down into nice bite-sized chunks, made it pretty simple. You should teach for us. And um, once I did start teaching, I, I really enjoyed helping such a diverse group of people. Um, at the community college, we had people that were engineers already in their own country, and they were coming over to become technicians in our country because their degree didn't count. So anything I could do to make their transition easier from helping them with a resume to um, writing them a letter of recommendation or connecting them with an employer. um, I felt like that was part of my job as their teacher. And I know that's a huge part of the work that you do now at Cavalero as well. And you work obviously with a different group of students, 
at the mid high school level. And I know that that's kind of non-traditional for a lot of our listeners. So I wanted to talk more about what are your students like, the group that you're teaching in the classroom today? So our school is really a unicorn school. We're uh, mid high, which is eighth and ninth grade. I don't teach eighth grade. I only teach ninth grade now. I use both. Um, so we're a freshman campus. And when we get done with our students, we send them up to the senior high school where they'll go 10 through 12. So um, think of it as an opportunity to, to really work on those freshmen and help them as they get ready to go out into their high school career. Um, anything we can do to help them set themselves up better, we can do it in ninth grade, whether that's take the right classes, think about what career field they want to go into. Um, One student said it, he said, you keep me up at night because I'm not sure what I want to do. And I'm worried that I'm going to disappoint you. And I went, I tell them my stories all the time. I was going to be a forest ranger. I said, when I was your age, I thought I was going to be a forest ranger. All of my classes centered around being a forest ranger. I'm not a forest ranger, but it got me thinking and going on a path. And that path took me to a different place. If they're not up and thinking They're never going to even find a path. So that's our job. Our job is to get them um, there and on their path and thinking. And as they grow and change and and their interests change, they need to know how to pivot with that and be flexible and um, and figure out their course. So the kind of student. Sorry. Yeah, I know that that's a unique situation for a lot of students. I just the workforce is so different now than it was even 10, 15, 20 years ago, where people aren't staying in one industry necessarily as long as they used to. And you're a huge example of that as well, that, you know, just because I had a path initially that I started on doesn't mean that that's where I'm going to end up. And education is where you've landed and where you've really excelled. But I know that that hasn't come without challenges. So I wanted to talk about some of those as well and how you've been able to overcome some of those um, challenges that you see in education in the classroom. Um, Some of the challenges that we're facing post-COVID, they're definitely different than pre-COVID. So um, the post-COVID challenge is really that the student has changed. We like to think as educators that they change, but we've also changed. Educators have changed. And uh, we need to recognize that change. So um, we need to make sure that our expectations are um, realistic and um, in the best interest of the student, not just for our program or any of that. That that needs to be something that's valuable for students. Why am I making this do tomorrow? Can they turn it in Friday? You know what I mean? Can they do part of it? Um, You need to ask yourself those questions because maybe we never asked those questions before COVID. But our student, our students have changed, so we need to change with them. Um, and if that means that maybe our projects change, maybe we've had all the projects that we used to love and tried and true projects, we maybe need to find some that are more interesting to kids, whatever they're interested in now. So maybe do more polls. What are you interested in? Um, I know we went through a time where everybody thought they were going to be a YouTube influencer. Well, I think that time has gone now and everybody thinks they're going to be in, you know, something in the metaverse. They think they're going to be having their own businesses. So you have to be in touch with what the students want. And that's how you're going to overcome those obstacles is if you can create a project around what they love and they're interested in, um, you're going to do really well. And that's one thing that I love, actually, when we came to visit your classroom, was seeing how diverse the students' interests are and how somehow you have a connection in, it seems like, any type of field, anything that your students want to do, you know someone who does that. And so you're able to kind of connect them with people in industry if they wanted to explore that as a career or even just job shadow and talk to them a little bit more about that. So how over the years have you been able to maintain those relationships and how do you bring that networking skill into the classroom for your kids? Well, first of all, it it becomes sort of a hobby. You want to think of it like that. So if you have your own hobby, maybe you um, you do car racing or maybe you do snow skiing, 
while you're doing that thing that you love, you should be, you know, when you're talking to your friends and the new people you meet, I always ask, what do they do for a living? Um, And I find out what people do. And then I tell them a little bit about my classroom. And um, oftentimes I'll invite them in or say, hey, if you ever want to be a guest speaker, here's my card. And if they do contact me, then I have, you know, this new person in my network. I also try to keep current with um, students as they progress in their own careers. Like we have some recent graduates that are um, Alaska Airline pilots, um, some that work up in Alaska on Kodiak Island as plant managers. Um, We have a gal who's a geologist in Olympia. So these are former students who I have connected with them either over social media or um, LinkedIn. And I always send them little notes of support, or if I find somebody else that might connect with them, I'll try to connect those two people together so that it can help build each of them. Um, I think one of my favorite things was whenever I was do PD, I also talked to people about my program. I recently did something in um, at the Naval Academy. So I was at the Naval Academy, and this young man who was a recent grad was helping his professor with our with our um, lab. And I, he was just really fun and, and gregarious. And I thought my students would love him. So I said, you know, I think students would love to hear your story if you want to come in as a guest speaker. And he's been my guest speaker twice now. So it's nice to have him come in and talk about living in an uh, inner city environment, never touched a computer till um, he went in the Naval Academy. And now he's cybersecurity for the Navy. So it, it's, a lot of the kids actually said that was pretty inspiring. So if you find somebody, you should probably try to keep them on your mental list or in your um, business card list so that you can connect with them and always send a thank you. So if they, um, if they said they might talk to you, maybe shoot out a little thank you. Like, gee, I sure appreciate that, you know, you think you might be able to share your time with us. Uh, whenever it's convenient to you, we'd love to talk to you. So always follow up. And I I saw that in the classroom and I wanted to dive a little bit more into the days that I was able to be there with you and your students and kind of what that looked like as far as networking goes. So you brought in professionals and you had them come in and talk to your students. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how you set that up, why you find that that's valuable and what your students kind of took away from that experience. So. Um, as a mom of four, there's there's areas that I'm better at than others. Um, I have a son who's an engineer, and I came out of a manufacturing environment, so I have a tendency to know that arena much better than, say, healthcare. So, and I know that I'm not a huge, you know, I'm not great in healthcare, but the students need that. So, whenever I um, have friends that are nurses or anesthesiologists or dentists, I always you know, particularly gravitate towards them. So how would you get people just to come into your room? Well, you could say that you can use your advisory committee. um, But if you're like me, I could do better with my recruiting and have a larger, um, more robust advisory committee because we can't do everything. Mine is, um, it's a good solid advisory committee, but it's not, you know, as big as it could be. Um, So the places I go to recruit, I first start at the Chamber of Commerce. Um, for my town, I go to city hall and ask everybody that's part of the legislative government for the city. Even the mayor has come in and done this for us. The senators for the district, those kind of folks, you definitely have them come in. Um, Rotary Club, Rotarians love to help. Um, you have to give Rotarians enough lead time and tell them a little bit about what your ask is. If you can, maybe even meet them for one of their breakfasts or lunches um, during the summer so they know your face and bring a student with you so that they they can see some success there and say, um, yeah, this is a program I want to support. So um, I would include even your school board. I've invited my school board to come and be part of uh, what we do. I'm never afraid to have anybody come into my classroom. Some of my um, other teachers say, I. I don't really like all those people in my room. Why not? Have them in. It's going to be fun. I love that. And I know that 
students learn so much more when there are multiple adults that they feel are supporting them and that they know that they have kind of a, a network of people that they can turn to as well. So what an awesome opportunity you're giving them. And I know that's obviously a big part of what you do, but you have other things that you do so well. So what advice would you share with other educators who are looking for some ideas from our educator of the year? Well, if I had to give any advice, I would say being a teacher, people don't realize when they become a teacher that they are supposed to do everything for these students. Kind of like a parent, when you think of what a parent does, nobody tells us how many things we're going to have to do, right? Um, we can't we can't do everything well. So what you want to do is pick one thing and become an expert at the one thing. And the one thing, obviously, that you're passionate about. So for me, it's always, you know, resumes and interviews. I'm super passionate about that. Um, so I can really refine that and do it well. Then you want to surround yourself with experts that are good at their one thing. So a lot of your teacher buddies, they are experts. You should recognize that you're dealing with a big group of experts and use your group for what they know how to do and take your skills and give it to them so that if you can contribute to somebody else's program with your level of expertise, they'll contribute back to you with something that they know. Um, for instance, the uh, the gentleman at the high school that does videography does such a great job with his videography that we talk a lot about storytelling and how could you do that if you were going to create your own web page. Um, and then I always refer them up to Mr. Cogswell because he does such a great job and he's happy to have me help whenever he wants to talk about how do you get a job and how would you find your internship. So he's he's the better digital storyteller and I'm the better resume person because we can't be experts at everything. So have friends. I love that. Have friends and surround yourself with people who have skill sets that are different than yours. I think oftentimes when we're in a professional setting, it's easy to gravitate toward people who are similar to us and even in a social setting as well. So being able to spread your wings a little bit will open up so many opportunities, not just for you professionally, but to your point, to give more to your students and give them more than you can give them alone. It also that. lightens your load as a teacher because mm -hmm. when I was when I was a young teacher, I was great at seeing big picture and have great ideas. But when it went down to the minutia and the tiny bits of being organized, eh, it wasn't so great. <laughs> so my dear friend Elizabeth, she got me organized. She pulled out Excel and we went through and she made all sorts of things for my grading. That's before the days of online grading. I'm showing my age. So we did a lot of very um, organizing pieces together that I don't think I would have been able to do, do without a teacher that had that level of um, organization. Mm -hmm. And what I contributed to her is I would go in and give her great ideas for her program. And together, we both got better. I love that. Any final thoughts? I, I feel like we could talk about this for a while and we could all learn so much from you, Karen, but any final thoughts that you wanted to share with well, our listeners? If they were listening and they were one of the teachers that were at the certified this year, you were a winner too. I mean, you came to the certified conference, you're trying to learn more about TV, whether you brought students or not this year, you might be bringing them next year, who knows? And you're, you're learning about how to help students. You're all educators here. I mean, that was, it's huge to be able to make that effort during our summertime to come to a PD like that, that's, that's obviously focused on our kids and helping our kids. So I'm very impressed with the big turnout that we had this year. And I hope it gets even bigger next year. Thank you so much, Karen. We really appreciate you. And congratulations again on this award. And I agree. It is just one opportunity that we have to recognize the amazing work that's happening with educators in their classrooms across the country and across the world. So we really appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to another episode of our podcast. We're so happy to have you as part of our certified community. Make sure to follow and rate our podcast so that we can bring more educators into our wonderful and supportive group. We're also here to connect, so feel free to join us by visiting www.certified.certiport.com.